Okay, here we have chapter two of Moby Dick. So luckily if you watch the chapter one video, you know how this is gonna go. We're using the acronym F-I-F. -F. Yellow is figurative, I is interesting, F is funny, and that goes yellow, orange, blue. So let's see what we got here. Uh, brief summary for chapter two, Ishmael arrives in New Bedford and is looking for a place to spend the night. The first passage I marked is, you know, two of these Kindle pages in, uh, and that's an orange. And it's after uh, our boy Ishmael has looked at a couple places to sleep and he's decided they look too fancy. Okay, he doesn't have much money. And then he he walks into this uh, place called The Trap, which is an interesting uh, name for an inn. And it says that it seemed the great black parliament sitting in top it. A hundred black faces turned round in their rows to peer, and beyond a black angel of doom was beating a book in a pulpit. It was a negro church, and the preacher's text was about the blackness of darkness, and the weeping and wailing and teeth gnashing there. Ha! Ishmael muttered I, backing out. Wretched entertainment at the sign of the trap. So, that's a really weird passage and scholars have talked about this for a long time of not really having a great understanding of why Ishmael has this weird interjection into for one paragraph into this black church and why he describes it so negatively that's really the question here why is it so negative uh if you're curious the black parliament also might refer as opposed to just like a gathering of black people it also might refer to a meeting of the scottish king robert's parliament in 1320 or to a meeting of king henry the eighth's parliament in 1524 and Tophet is a reference to an old testament biblical city which theoretically practiced child sacrifice as anyone bad did in the old testament that's what they accuse every city they don't like of child sacrifice but why are black people treated as being associated with doom and devastation and blackness and evil? As we continue to read Moby Dick, I think it'll become clear that Ishmael is not himself necessarily. Uh, well, I mean, I guess he is kind of prejudiced to begin with, but he has experiences which break down that prejudice for sure. Is this a comment on racism in 1851 America that black people are always labeled as being negative or dark? Is this a true opinion by Melville, who himself was an abolitionist and wrote plenty of anti-slavery texts? Uh, that seems improbable. So I think it's probably more about Ishmael's uh, perceptions than about Melville's. But it certainly troubles people who uh, who read this passage and go, why? Like, what's going on here? And I don't have a great answer to it. And I think part of the humility of reading Moby Dick is... <laughs> Letting yourself be vulnerable enough to say, here's what I think this is about, but goddamn, did Melville have a lot going on, and I can't say for sure. And this is one of those where I have to, I can give you my, my best interpretation, which is that it's trying to emphasize Ishmael's kind of provincial attitude towards difference, which will reoccur in chapter three when he meets Queequeg. But I have to have some humility here. We have another orange passage that I found interesting, which was Ishmael's statement that he finds the name uh, Peter Coffin at the Spouter Inn rather ominous in that particular connection. Uh, that obviously is doing some foreshadowing, right? Like you don't have a character stay at a an inn named after something that deals with a whale and an image of death without it having some implication. But of course, we're not even on the boat yet. So whatever implication this is going to have, I can't talk about. So, the big passage I want to talk about is Eurocladon. Okay, so before I read this passage, just some background. Eurocladon uh, was a Greek reference to the eastern winds that would blow in the Adriatic Gulf. Okay, and so eastern winds are usually colder than western winds and more unpleasant. So it is a personification of cold and devastating wind. Let's see what's being said here. It stood on a sharp bleak corner where that tempestuous wind Eurocladon kept up a worse howling than ever it did about poor Paul's tossed craft. So in legend, the apostle Paul is shipwrecked uh, on the coast of Malta. Okay. 
Euroclidon, nevertheless, is a mighty pleasant zephyr to anyone indoors, with his feet on the hob quietly toasting for bed. In judging of that tempestuous wind called Euroclidon, says an old writer, of whose works I possess the only copy extant, <laughs> it maketh a marvelous difference whether thou lookest out at it from a glass window where the frost is all on the outside, or whether thou observest it from the sashless window where the frost is on both sides, and of which the white death is the only glazier. Okay, And glazier here does not mean glacier, it means someone who installs window glass. Okay. So just before we move on, because there's more to read, let's just talk about that. First, back to that metatextual question. When Melville is writing an old writer of whose works I possess the only copy extant, it seems like such a self-awarely, transparently false claim to make. He doesn't name the writer, and he says he has the only copy. And this is Ishmael, apparently a guy who's background and education we know nothing of or even really his class structure we know nothing of yet he's got the only copy of something that exists i don't know why melville wants to do this but he does and and it, it definitely makes us question the reliability of anything that's being said so that's a again that literary or metafictional question of knowledge and then we have the obviously the importance of perspective here that if you're out on the street corner you're on the cold wind is a mighty pleasant zephyr to anyone indoors right? And in fact, this writer says that whether thou lookest out at it from the glass window where the frost is on the outside, or whether you observe it from the sashless window where the frost is on both sides, that makes all the difference, right? It makes all the difference whether your window is thick and can prevent the wind from coming in, or whether your sashless window uh, allows the wind to come right on in, and then you're not going to be so happy with your Oclodon, okay? True enough, thought I, as this passage occurred to my mind, old black letter, thou reasoned well. Okay, and, and I looked this up. There's some people who think that the author of the work uh, Ishmael seems to be quoting from is a, a, is a reference to a Gothic style of writing from the medieval period slash Renaissance period. Who knows? But nevertheless, he's just saying, I agree with the person who gave that quote. Yes, these eyes are windows, and this body of mine is the house. What a pity they didn't stop up the chinks and the crannies, though, and thrust in a little lint here and there. Okay, so if the writer that he's referencing is talking about the wind penetrating through a window into the house, uh, Ishmael is talking about wind penetrating into your body and making you cold. But it's too late to make any improvements now. The universe is finished. The copestone, the highest piece of brick, is on, and the chips were carted off a million years ago. Okay, so a weird kind of again, I guess a return to an idea we've been talking about in terms of fatalism. Ishmael is saying, well, we can't petition God to change anything now. The world is what it is. Poor Lazarus there, chattering his teeth against the curbstone for his pillow and shaking off his tatters with his shiverings, he might plug up both ears with rags and put a corn cob into his mouth, a type of pipe. And yet that would not keep out the tempestuous Euroclodon. Euroclodon, says old Dives in his red silken wrapper, he had a redder one afterwards. Poo poo, what a fine frosty night. How Orion glitters. What northern lights. Let them talk of their oriental summer climes of everlasting conservatories. Give me the privilege of making my own summer with my own coals. Okay. So this is an allusion to the biblical story of uh, Lazarus and Divas. Okay. Lazarus is a beggar who starves at, to death at the gate of a rich man, Divas, and he goes to heaven. Then Divas dies and goes to hell. And Divas asks Abraham if Lazarus can bring him a drop of water. And Abraham says no. So well, that gets continued here, but it seems in this first introduction of the metaphor, it just seems a further emphasis on the importance of perspective, that based on one's circumstances or one's experience, uh, a particular event can be interpreted in two different ways. Euroclodon is seen as pleasant by Dives, who is sitting inside and uses it to contrast his warmth with the cold outside, whereas Lazarus actually has to experience that cold and nothing he does, be it plugging his ears with rags or the corn cob, can prevent his experience of Euroclodon. Of course, we have 
a double entendre here in the last line. Give me the privilege of making my own summer with my own coals. Is that physical coals because Divas is sitting inside? Or is that a metaphysical or spiritual coals of burning in hell, which is theoretically uh, Divas's ultimate fate? Because of his lack of empathy, which kind of goes back to that uh, universal sympathy we were talking about in chapter one. But what thinks Lazarus? Can he warm his blue hands by holding them up to the grand northern lights? Would not Lazarus rather be in Sumatra than here? Would he not far rather lay him down lengthwise along the lane of, line of the equator? Yea, ye gods, go down to the fiery pit itself in order to keep out the frost. Okay, so this is kind of, you know, a bold assertion by Ishmael that we tend to think of Lazarus in the story of Lazarus and Divas as the person who is rewarded with his spiritual uh, fulfillment. But of course, Ishmael is challenging that and saying, wait, is that spiritual fulfillment any importance to Lazarus when he's on earth? Would Lazarus not rather go into the fiery pit itself in order to keep out this frost? Now, obviously, if hell is guaranteed, if it's a true concept, if there was knowledge that hell exists, of course he wouldn't prefer it, and Lazarus is uh, in the better position. But in the world of Lazarus, where he's not sure that hell exists, would he not rather risk the possibility of something he doesn't know to be true, which is the existence of hell, for the guaranteed comfort and relief of no longer being tormented by Eurachlodon? It's an interesting question and one that Ishmael raises. Now that Lazarus should lie stranded there on the curbstone before the door of Divas, this is more wonderful than that an iceberg should be moored to one of the Moluccas. Yet Divas himself, he too lives like a czar in an ice palace made of frozen size, and being president of a temperance society, he only drinks the tepid tears of orphans. Okay, so what is this saying? It seems to say that in the end, Divas is the one who is cold, right? Even though he's in hell, uh, I assume this is drawing on the imagery of Dante insofar as the ninth circle of hell is freezing cold and that ultimately Lazarus will get his reward uh, at the end. Uh, it is more wonderful that he is stranded here than the iceberg is more to the Maluccas, right? It's, a, it's an even more exceedingly rare and special sight. And... Uh, his coldness is physical, whereas the coldness of Divas is spiritual. So weirdly, and this is not actually weird if you know Melville, weirdly Melville seems to take both sides. He seems to say in the second to last paragraph, wait, wouldn't Lazarus rather go to hell in order to warm himself? And then he says, well, no, actually Lazarus is the one who's getting the better part of this deal, and maybe Divas is the one getting screwed. The highlight of Melville here is that it's ambiguous, that he's not just going to give you an easy answer to that question. You're going to have to think about your understanding of the truth or falsity of spiritual versus physical comfort and reward yourself. And he is raising the question, but leaving it open for you to think about, which is the sign of a mature and interesting text. It would be far less interesting if this was a two-line polemic about, hey, you might be cold, but at least remember you're going to heaven. This is a really interesting uh, investigation of whether one should believe that or not, and whether that is a wise way to understand the universe or not.